Amen. And amen. And amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords, the ancient of days, the God in whose hands all things are possible. We have come once more to your holy presence to come and listen to your word. Because, Lord, you have the word of hope, the word of life. You are the one that gives eternal life. You are eternal life, Jesus. Come and have your way tonight. Come and saturate us with your power. Father, we need you. Come and do something new in the life of your children. Hell, Jesus. Jesus. Come and decorate your children with your presence. Father, we cannot do without you tonight. We ask for mercy, mighty Jesus. Let your mercy speak tonight. Let your mercy locate us tonight. Father, we need you. Forgive us our sins, for we have sinned against you. Father, have mercy. Come and have your way. Come and touch your children. Use this message of this night to bless your people. Let the world know that indeed we are serving a living God, a God that is faithful. Father, come and take over tonight. Let your blood cover us tonight, and let your most precious blood sanctify us tonight. Give in, cleanse our hearts, wash us clean, that we shall be whiter than snow. Blessed be your name. We know you have heard us. We know you have answered us. Because your word says, ask and you shall receive. Now we have asked for mercy. We have asked for forgiveness of sins. We are confident that you will not fail your people who are asking for mercy and forgiveness. And so, Father, we thank you for the faith you have given to us to believe that you have answer the prayers of your children. Now, we therefore, starting on Hebrew 4 verse 16, now approach your throne of grace, Lord. That throne where the holy sanctuary begins to touch your children. That throne where the river of mercy flows. That throne where the river from the sanctuary is that river of grace. The grace to listen to you, to receive from you, and to keep that which we receive from you, to retain it, not to lose it. The grace to receive mercy from you. Father, we thank you for coming to settle us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We command every diabolical spirit that may have been on assignment to interrupt this message in any form or manner or to make someone not to listen by way of distractions or by way of sleep. Father, tonight we hold captive such spirits. We decree that they have no room for assignment in this place of prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. And amen. Thank you, Jesus. My own dear friends, my dear people of God, 
I have the great pleasure tonight to welcome every one of us to the hearts of Jesus and Mary Ministries. Today, we continue with the message of yesterday. The message of yesterday was titled, Touch Me, Lord. Touch me, Lord. And we saw how God touched the blind man. We saw how the Lord visited him and showed him mercy. Today, Mark Volume 2 of this message. And we are going to repeat the same scripture that we read yesterday. So we read again Luke chapter number 18, verse 35 to 43. Luke chapter number 18, verse 35 to 43. And it is my pleasure to read from the New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front of him or steadily ordered him to keep quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, as I highlighted in the opening remar remarks of this message, we saw that Jesus visited the blind man a man that life, troubles of life, gave him a seat along the roadside. He was kept there to be begging. 
Then Jesus was passing by. And this man, upon learning that Jesus was passing by, asked for healing. And Jesus healed him. His prayer point was, Lord, that I may see again. Jesus did not despise him. Yesterday, in the volume one of this message, it pleased the Holy Spirit to bring to our attention that that same Jesus that passed the way of the blind man is also here with us, passing our way, passing your way. <laughs> that same Jesus in Luke 18, verse 35, that approached Jericho and saw that blind man sitting by the roadside begging. That same Jesus is also approaching your house, your family, your destiny. Approaching whatever you are going through in your life, Jesus is also approaching your own Jericho. To pull down the walls of Jericho tonight and visit you in a special way. Just like in the ancient time, before this episode, the power of God pulled down the walls of Jericho, that the people of God may enter into the land of promise. So the Lord, the Almighty God, Jesus Christ himself, approached Jericho and they lifted the embargo against this blind man. He pulled down the wall of limitation against this blind man. He pulled down the walls of Jericho that had been set up spiritually to stop this man from being the man, the person that God created him to be. And I pray tonight that this same Jesus that came to Jericho and pulled down the walls of Jericho that have besieged this man and kept him in a miserable situation in life, that this same Jesus will use this message tonight to pull down the walls of Jericho that have been set up by the evil ones against your life in the name of Jesus. That wall of Jericho against somebody's business, today by the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that mighty Jesus that the blind man called Jesus of Nazareth in Luke 18, verse 37. That same Jesus is the one we are calling now because we know that in Romans 10, verse 13, that whosoever shall call upon that name shall be saved. And we call on him to come to save his people. We call on him to come and save our marriages and families and children. We call on him to come and save every epileptic business, businesses that are going down, businesses that are suffering, Businesses that have been held captive by the evil ones, we are calling upon that mighty Jesus to come tonight and visit his people and take away that very blanket of captivity. Father, come and have your way and touch your children tonight. The hour has come. Jesus. You see, the blind man had only one thing that he needed. He had a heart desire. And that was for him to see again. All this time, this blind man had been begging. Have been begging for food, begging for coins, begging for people's, you know, support to him, people to help him, to do something for him, just to give him money and all that. He was asking them because he was a beggar. But then when he heard that Jesus was passing that way, <laughs> this man did not stop begging. 
he instead of begging man, he began to beg God. He began to beg Jesus. Asking Jesus not for coin. Amen? Did he ask Jesus for coin? Of course no. But you know that all that people that were passing by all these years, he had been begging people for coin, for money. Something to satisfy his 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 uh, outward life, his his uh, appearance, something to sustain him physically. Not to solve his problem. But now, look at Jesus passing by. He never asked him, give me money. This man had known that Jesus is the one who heals. Who gives it all. The one that brings peace. To those that are troubled. The one that nothing is difficult for him. This man, when he learned that Jesus was passing by his own road, his way, he asked him that thing that he never asked any man to do for him. The blind man never asked any man to give him sight. Why? Because he knew that no man would do that. He knew that. And when he learned that the one who was able to change his ugliness, his situation was around, he now changed his request. And then he asked, give me sight that I may see. Jesus is the only one who can bring all the peace our heart desires and that our hearts long for. Only Jesus. Only him can show us pity. Only him. <laughs> Who? Jesus. The situation of the blind man was a situation of pity. Imagine the way the Bible describes him. A blind man. Luke 18 verse 35. A blind man sitting by the roadside. Yesterday, in volume one of this message, we saw that being on the roadside, he was a victim of circumstances. The, 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 the sun will smite him. The hot weather will, will heat him up. The cold weather will uh, uh, freeze him. He was just taking it all. Life was just dumping troubles, calamity, all sorts of death on him. Somebody will just pass with a chariot, running speed, and then the doors will cover this man. You see that? People never cared to make him friend. He was alone there, begging. I want to take time to see the situation of this man. It was indeed a situation that calls for pity. Like, we were meant to understand yesterday that most people would see him and go to the other side of the road. They don't want to go his side because they might think that he might infect them with blindness. Some had misunderstood him that this he was blind because of his sins. Who knows what his father did that that resulted in this calamity? This man was indeed suffering. But you see, Jesus comes for the sake of those who are suffering. He comes to show pity on us. So this man qualifies for God's pity. 
May I use the opportunity to remind us that even in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, that the Lord seeing the misery of the people in Egypt, then the Bible says, and this is God actually talking, saying in Exodus 3, verse 7, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out to me because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about what they are going through. Do you know, my dear people of God, that God is concerned about our misery? God is concerned about the pity situation we are going through. God is concerned about the misery we are going through. No wonder the Bible also tells us that God said, I am concerned on how to deliver my people from Egypt. I am concerned about this, the, 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 the way uh, Pharaoh was subjected them to slavery, to suffering. I am concerned about that. I, I want to visit them. I want to turn this around for them. That is God talking, and this is God talking to you. So you have concerned about what you are going through. I am concerned about your suffering. And so Exodus 3 verse 8 now says, So I have to come down from heaven to rescue my people. <laughs> Is that your Bible? <laughs> so in Exodus 3 verse 7, the Lord saw their misery, the Lord saw their cry, and he was concerned about what they were going through. He was concerned about the suffering, but he does not stop there. Man may be concerned about what you are going through, but may not do anything. Man may be, sub may be concerned, oh, look at what this man, the way the situation this man is going through. But the person may not change your situation. But God says, I am concerned. And when God says, I'm concerned, it means he wants to do something to, for you. When God says, I am concerned, it means it's a time of your testimony, a time to turn this around. When God says, I am concerned, it's because he wants to take you out of that misery. He wants to bring a divine turn around. And so the Bible says in Exodus 3 verse 8, So I have come to rescue you, to rescue them from the misery they are going through. God coming down from heaven is not for a joke. It is to do something. God cannot just leave heaven. Can you imagine the glory of heaven and all the ways they enjoying the angelic uh, worship and all that, and then he will leave all this to come to visit you. You think he just visits you, come and look at you like that? No! He visits you to show you pity, to show you mercy, to turn things around. Look at the Bible and tell me if there's any man that God visited, that God did not turn things around for such a person. Tell me. Is it Jabez? We know, of course, that God enlarged his course. Is it Jacob? <laughs> God even changed his name and gave him Israel. God blessed him and told him, Jacob, your brother will not kill you. I will be with you. I will lead you in this journey. I will be with you in this journey until you get to where you are going. And I will bring you back safely. And I will bless you. And that was what happened. While Esau was planning to kill the brother, Jacob and Jacob found himself in a foreign land. In a strange place, in the uncle's house, Leban. It was there he married <laughs> the daughters of Leban, had children. God blessed him so mightily. He had, he had flock, big one. But God blessed Leban because of Jacob, actually. And by the time that this same Jacob was coming back, was coming back a different man. A man loaded with blessings. A man that had, that left single, running for his life, came back a multitude. He left his, his father's house as Jacob, but he came back as Israel. You know the difference? He left as a man, Jacob. He came back as a nation, Israel. And by the time Esau was seeing him, <laughs> Esau saw a different man. Esau had a problem with Jacob, but not Israel. <laughs> because God had taken this man to a higher level. God has taken this man to become a nation. Esau was having problem with a man, not with a nation. But this man is now coming back as a nation. When God takes you high, even your enemies cannot behold you again. <laughs> Woo! 
Jesus. So my dear people of God, the pity that the blind man had asked or begged Jesus was the pity he received. The Bible had been fulfilled. Is it not true? Matthew 7, verse 7, Ask and you shall receive. He asked for pity. Pity he got. This beggar kept begging, kept begging. Begging, begging became his life. But this time, he begged the one who has power to say to him, I cannot forget First Peter 5 verse 10. After you have suffered a while, I will say to you, God is a God of settlement, my friend, a God of restoration. There's no bad situation we find ourselves that God cannot turn this around. I mean, man may say, oh, that's nothing, nothing that could be done. This person is finished. That's what man says. But the Bible says, Matthew 19 verse 20, says that with man, this is impossible. But with God, woo! With God, all things are possible. There's nothing that God cannot do, friends. And so, even if the world has condemned us, just like they condemned this blind man, Jesus cannot, and he would not. He's a great God. He's a great God. He's a God that loves his people. Amen. <laughs> Do you know that all of us, world beggars, so we are all like this blind man begging God for mercy. Even prayer is to beg God. When we go on our knees to pray, we are begging God. When we are saying, God, give me a job, God. Help me to go through this situation victoriously. God, turn this around. You are begging God, just like this blind man. And the wisdom demands that we beg the one who is able to save us, the one who is able to help us. When we are begging the world or begging human being, or let me put it this way, trusting human beings or trusting God is a waste of time. If you go to God and beg him, God can now use man, if he wants to, to settle us. And he will not fail. But if you are begging man, what if God does not, is not, part of, he does not enable you in that begging? You waste your time. The blind man had been begging people all this while, but none gave him sight. But when he begged God, God gave him sight. Amen. All he asked was, Lord, let me see again. Let me see. When this man asked Jesus, let me see. When this man made this request, Jesus answered him. You know what that tells us tonight? That Jesus promises us that he will listen to our prayer requests. Just as he did to the blind man. But I wish to add. <laughs> it is not every prayer request that Jesus answers. It is not every prayer request that Jesus answers. He answers those prayer requests that are in line which is we for us. Do you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> this man asks that which was in line with God's will. He, there were so many things that this man would have asked. Don't you know that? But he didn't ask them. He didn't ask them. He asked that which was what he needed, not what he wanted. I don't know this man. 
But I'm sure that being a beggar, he was wearing tattered cloth. He would have asked Jesus, please give me cloth to wear. That would have been a, a, a need. That would have been what he wanted. <laughs> but he didn't ask for Jesus, ask Jesus to give him clothes to wear. As he was begging, of course, the Bible tells us in Luke 18, verse 35, that he was sitting by the roadside. So this man was sitting. Perhaps he was sitting on a stool. Perhaps. And that stool cannot be comfortable. So he would have asked Jesus, please, Please give me a stool that is comfortable. Or make this stool more comfortable for me. So that I can balance more, you know, without pains. And, and then be able to uh, ask people for, for help. You could have asked that. Ask Jesus to do that. To ask, to ask, to make that stool comfortable so that he can have... Better is, he did not do that. This man had a, 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 a cup, you know, or a plate that he usually extends to people passing by to drop their coins. Who knows whether that plate or cup was leaking. Maybe it, 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 it has a leaking stuff. Uh, he may have been concerned that the money will be falling or dropping. The worst is that he's not even seen. So if the money drops, if the money leaks out or falls through the plate or through the cup and falls on the ground, he may not even know because he wasn't seen. So he could have asked Jesus to give him a silver cup or a golden cup to use in collecting the coins. But this man did not ask that. I have a case to make here, my friends. That this man did not ask these things. What he asked was that which was the will of God. That I may see. It's only the Holy Spirit that can open our eyes to ask the right request or the, to, to the right prayer point, to make the right prayer point. That is why when we begin to pray, we invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us how to pray. Even the Bible tells us how can we pray without the help of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so Jesus gives us his, or sends for the Holy Spirit to us to teach us how to pray. That's one of the reasons God sent the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it is the spirit of prayer. That's the Holy Spirit. When we call on Him to come and direct us in prayer, He comes. Then He begins to pray through us. So that the right prayer that God wants shall be made. So we need the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit that intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, as Romans eight twenty six tells us. Okay, we don't even know how to pray. No human being can make a right prayer without the help of the Holy Spirit. So for this reason, we need the Holy Spirit. Amen? We need the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit becomes part and parcel of our prayer, such prayer will please God. Because the Holy Spirit is not enabling us to make the right prayer. The blind man found the favor of God and was moved by the Holy Spirit to make the right prayer. You see, often what we really need is not what we ask in prayer. Oftentimes, we miss the mark. 
Jesus says the other day, the reason why you pray you don't receive because you pray and you pray amiss. Amiss. That you miss the mark. <laughs> you are praying in flesh. When we pray in the flesh, we miss it. And that is why when we invite the Holy Spirit, then He comes with His supernatural power to give us the grace to pray. In fact, He prays through us. He gives us the eye of the mind, the eye of the spirit to see the right prayer to make. We need the vision that only the supernatural virtue of faith can give. Amen? We need the ability to see everything from God's vantage point. Okay? Not from man's vantage point, but from God's position. To see things from the angle of God, it is only the Holy Spirit that can do that. It's only the Holy Spirit. All right? It's only the Holy Spirit that can help us to see the bigness of our God and not the bigness of the problems confronting us. Only the Holy Spirit. So we are praying and the Holy Spirit with us. He helps us not to focus on the difficulties or trials or problems or blindness or disabilities. But he helps us to focus on the bigger picture, on the promises of God. You see that? <laughs> I remember many years ago a sister in in our legion of Mary those days, very prayerful lady. She was more or less like my prayer partner. She was a student and working in the same school where I was also a student. I know we belong to the same parish and the same religion of Mary. So we have so many things, had so many things that corrected two of us. But she had only one prayer point. <laughs> I want to get married. I want to get married. I know Brother Okwe was praying. That was, that was the dominant prayer request. I want to get married. Kept praying. She will be fasting, praying, going to morning mass. Very faithful lady. May God bless her wherever place she is right now. Never messing up. But you see, she had always asked me, brother, I don't know why God doesn't want to answer this prayer. One day God answered it. <laughs> I mean, God re revealed why why he was not answering that, 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 that prayer. And, and the day God, God spoke this thing, I mean, you know, we look so foolish, really. <laughs> that all the time we're making the wrong prayer point. And God said, look, I know you are up to the age of marriage in your thinking. But I am using your prayers to do something more important in your family, in your father's house. That's what God said. I'm using your prayers to do something more important in your father's house. So keep praying. Keep fasting. I will say to that one, but not now. I'm using it for to, to do something more important. You see the way the Holy Spirit does things? He sees the reality. We see the, the, the shadows. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Who knows? Maybe the husband was not, was not even around. I mean, God knows why he said, it is not time. But you are making... A prayer that I'm using for something else. <laughs> Jesus! You may be praying, God, give me, give me children. 
It is not a bad prayer. And God may tell you, I am using that prayer request you are making to settle other issues that are more important, other problems that are more important. You see, God? There was one midnight I was praying with my wife. We were storming, storming heaven, praying. And the Holy Spirit just changed our prayer point. He said there was a woman in India. I would not even know the woman. He said there's a woman in India that, need, that, that is crying for her son to repent. That her son is into dirty life, into drugs and all that. And, it, and in the spirit, this woman appeared in a vision and was crying. The Lord just showed it in a vision. I said, pray for her. Look at her problem. We changed our prayer point and began to pray for a woman who never met, who never knew to today. Do you see the Holy Spirit how he does the things? <laughs> Is it possible that somebody, that this prayer point you have been making may not even be what God wants you to be making? Even though that, from human point of view, this is the right thing to pray for. But, you see, it is important to even ask Holy Spirit, what is your mind concerning this? If the Holy Spirit tells you you are making the right prayer, then keep making the prayer. But if he tells you no, what you are praying for, is not my will. It's not the will of God for you. This is the right prayer. We have to be inviting the Holy Spirit, involving Him in our prayers. It cannot be said enough that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot make a nice or good, acceptable prayer. No way. Even if the, the, the prayer looks Beautiful in the eyes of man. Even though it, it may carry some fire. Oh, people, whoo, this is wonderful. But if the Holy Spirit is not there, it's just a show. It's just a show. Amen? <laughs> Jesus. The Holy Spirit. When God delivered the people of Israel from Egypt and God was with them, leading them, meanwhile, God took them to a longer route. He saw a shorter course, but he didn't allow them to go through that shorter course. He took them through a longer course. So that they will stay longer time in the wilderness. Their prayer point was not for God to take them through that wilderness. They had wanted God to even take them straight forward. But God took them through a longer route. God had his own reason for doing it. And the Bible tells us that reason. That if, if I allow them to go through the shorter course... They will have to go through the land of the enemies. And uh, the enemies will fight them. And they will, some of them will change their minds and go back to Egypt. You see, because by that time, the people of Israel hadn't really fought wars. They hadn't really seen the power of God at work. They, they never knew that God is a man of war, that the God leading them is a man of war. They had not known that. They had not known that God would divide the Red Sea. Those things have never happened. In fact, it's actually after this event that God then told them in Exodus 14, then I am a man of war. Watch and see what I will do. In Exodus 14, verse 15, he now tells Moses, let these people not cry again. Tell them to make it, take a step of faith. Let them move forward. And then in Exodus 14, verse 16, he now tells Moses, lift up your rod over the sea and they defied it. And my people will pass through, as, uh, through the sea as though they were walking on the ground. Those were later events, but when God was telling, was leading them through the desert, the people of Israel were not happy. Why go into the desert? No food, no water. Why? Moses, why did they bring us here? They were even grumbling. 
God took them to that path. And they, all their prayers, why would God take us through that out? God, all those prayers were wrong prayers. <laughs> Do you hear that? God may be taking you through a long journey now. But you see, you may not understand why. But I want to tell you tonight, God knows why He's allowing you to go through that longer journey. He knows why He's allowing you to go through that wilderness. Nobody prays, God, send me to the wilderness. God, send me to a place of suffering. I've never heard anybody make that kind of prayer point, not even me. Yet I find myself in the, in the wilderness. Yet I find myself in a state of suffering. Yet I have to carry the cross. Nobody have ever made a prayer and said, God, give me the heaviest cross. Let it, let me carry it. Let it break. Look, nobody. But yet, with God gives us the cross. People run away the cro from the cross. It is Jesus that took the cross boldly. And he's inviting us to take the cross. But even the cross we carry is the one he gives to us. We don't go to him and say, Jesus, give me cross, give me cross. I need to... <laughs> hey! You see, the ways of God are different from the ways of man. His ways are different. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can help us to really know the ways of God, to understand what He wants us to do. Only the Holy Spirit. We need Him. <laughs> Jesus. So what is the prayer point you are making now? We're asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us The mind of God concerning that prayer point. God answered the prayers of the blind Bartimaeus, or rather, the, the prayer of the blind man, because he made the right prayer request. We should stop asking Jesus to give us. The cup of <laughs> the silver cup to collect the coins. We should stop asking Jesus to give us the comfortable stool to sit down and keep begging. We should stop asking Him to change this cloth so that we can be able to attract people to give us. The begin. My dear people of God, Jesus wants to help us. He wants us to listen to Him. He wants us to come to Him with trust, with the faith of this blind Bartimaeus, of this blind man. Amen. <laughs> When we come to him with such a faith, with such a trust, we have an assurance of victory. We have that assurance. So we have to have a firm assurance of the final victory of Jesus. We have to go to him to receive strength, to persevere. Part of the troubles will go. We have to persevere. The other day, in Luke 17, verse 5, the disciples of Jesus we are asking Jesus, please, please, Lord, increase our faith. That's the right prayer point. The right prayer point. shall we go on our knees and say, Lord, give me a heart of prayer. Make me an intercessor to be standing the gap for those who I need. 
It was the day I came to the church to pray. I already, in my mind, had my prayer point. I came, the Lord said, I want you to begin to pray for my church. Of course, when the, when, when the master says, this is what he wants, of course, there's no need to even talk about your, your, your own. He said, pray for my church. I began to pray for the church. He changed the prayer point. You see the way the Holy, Holy Spirit does it? You may be planning on how to deal with a matter. But the Holy Spirit can come and minister to you how to do it. Because He wants you to succeed. The Holy Spirit. Even when we are going on, on a spiritual warfare, it is only the Holy Spirit that can give us the strategy to win that battle. If you think that because somebody fasted seven days and seven nights and had a hard testimony, therefore I must go and do the same thing and get the same result. You might do it without getting that result. Because even two problems that look alike do not necessarily <laughs> have the same solution to them. Two problems, they may look alike. Take for example, two persons may be Maybe asking God for, say, uh, Lord, we want to get married. And God may reveal to us one of them and say, this is what you have to do. I want you to fast three days and three nights. And he, he, if she does it, she'll get results. Because that is the key to open the door. If the other person who is also making the same prayer point. Now, hearing the testimonies of her friend, or, or her prayer point, her, her prayer partner, begins to make the same, take the same step without asking Holy Spirit for direction. She may not get a result. And if she begins to pray, her own results, her own breakthrough may come by something different. God may tell her, go and sow a seed. Oh, that reminds me. You see, before I got this job I'm, 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 I'm having now in, in, in my university, I, I was living in Tennessee with my family. And the job was not forthcoming. And the Lord had already told me clearly in the vision that the devil will come to fight you, fight you to make sure you don't get a job. So I was fasting and praying, fasting and praying. Then one day, the Lord told me to move to South Carolina. I moved to South Carolina because the Lord told me to move to South Carolina. It was very obvious that the Lord told me to move to South Carolina. I wasn't even doubting it whether it was him. He, I asked for confirmations. He, he showed it to me in a vision. He confirmed it. And then I, while I was try, trying to understand why would I move to South Carolina, what do I do there? He, he didn't even give me the details. The Lord did not give me those details. I prayed and prayed. Only thing he told me is, if you go to South Carolina, I will bless you. <laughs> and these are the kind of things you begin to tell people because people, some of them may think that, I mean, why, why would you go to South Carolina? I don't know anybody there. You don't know anybody in South Carolina. At least you can stay here in Tennessee. At least you have some few friends that might help you. You don't have a job. You don't have a job. At least you have some few friends that could help you. You are going to a place you don't know anybody. But the Lord said, clear to me, go to South Carolina. And he showed me a, a palm tree with, with the ripe fruits standing on the soil of South Carolina. And I knew that, that, I knew that my blessings are there. I rented a U-Haul, moved all our, everything in the house to the U-Haul and moved. Just on faith, on faith. It looks foolish, but that's how things of God is. You know, if you want to listen to God, if you want to follow what God is saying, in the eyes of man, you are foolish. We landed in South Carolina, <laughs> came to a particular city, just lodged in a in a hotel. With little resources. That was still hard. Little money left for uh, with us lodging a hotel. 
and be well covered up that room in the hotel into a warfare room. Keep praying. God, what next? We have come. We have come. And then from the hotel, after a few days, we now uh, moved into an apartment. With the little resources left. And stay praying, fasting, crying to God. God, what next? We came to Sakarana because you asked us to come here. We don't even know why we're here. And then one day one of my old time friends called me and said, Brother, how do you survive? I mean with your family. Your family, no job. How do you survive? I'll be asking myself this question. I said, Brother, it's a long story. He said, Well, um, send me a card number, I'm gonna send you some money. So he, he sent he sent me some money. And that was three hundred dollars. You need to see the way my wife and I we were so happy, thanking God. Oh, that money came through three hundred dollars. We are so happy. But then the Lord now spoke clearly to me and said, I don't want you to touch that money. You are going to give two hundred dollars to he mentioned somebody in Atlanta. He said you are going to send the other one to uh, he mentioned somebody in Nigeria. I was I was speechless. <laughs> you see God? I said, God, okay, I will do that. I didn't want to ask questions. I just I just closed my eyes and dispensed that the that three hundred dollars. A money that was vehemently needed. I gave it out. I gave it out like today. The next day I got a call from South Carolina State University concerning an appointment, uh, an application for a job position. The interview had already gone and they, they asked us to keep waiting and eventually they told me, okay, they have selected me, but because a new president came, uh, he now canceled all the appointment. So it was when I did sow that seed, when I did that thing God asked me to do, that was when I received that call the next day. And that is the university I'm still working to today. And when I got when I came to the university, a, a, a man told me, a professor told me, said, Sir, you're a lucky man. Because you are the only person that will, that that the university um took from that pool of people that we are um you know that, that, that we're supposed to uh, resume their, their jobs in different uh, faculties. And you are the only one. But, you know, they didn't know what happened in the background. So, it wasn't just the fasting that I did. It wasn't the prayer that we had done. It was Holy Spirit directing how to make the prayer. It was the Holy Spirit that I made. That is where I'm still working to today by God's grace. But that is the story of how I got I got into this job. Fasting and praying, binding the money forces that doesn't want you to get job. I, I remember when I would go to the mountains of Tennessee and I would be in the mountain praying there. I would go to the wilderness. I would stay there from morning till evening. In the in the mountains of of Tennessee. Praying in in a place that Nobody will hear my voice. Just a thick, thick forest in the woods. Praying. But after all these prayers, after all this burning and casting, burning the fussy that doesn't want you to get the job, fussy that doesn't want me to, to have the approval of the job to, to, so that I come, it was just to sow the seed that opened the door. The Holy Spirit is a way maker. Is God talking to us? <laughs> if we have the culture of inviting the Holy Spirit in our prayers, I tell you, God will give us powerful revelations. He give us powerful revelations. If you read Acts of Apostles, chapter 13, verse 2, you see where uh, after the fasting of Paul and his comrades, the Holy Spirit now told him, uh, look at the way forward. This you want to do, Paul, that is the wrong thing. What I want you to do is to separate for me 
Barabbas and Saul for the work I've called them. Go and read Acts 13 verse 2. The Holy Spirit ministered to them after they have fasted and said, separate for me Barabbas, Barabbas and uh, Saul for the work I called them. Okay? Otherwise, they would have sent the wrong people to, to get into the mission. But it could have said, it's not even though you have fasted and prayed, but this is what I want. I want Barabbas and Saul to go together for this assignment. You see the Holy Spirit at work? You remember when the Holy Spirit now told Philip to go to a certain way. And that way that he asked him to take was even the way that leads to the desert. And he, Philip, he didn't even tell Philip why he was to get into the desert way. But he entered into a desert way and was on that way. And that way led him to where he found the Ethiopian Enoch. The Ethiopian man. Who was on the horse reading the Bible, uh, the, 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 the scripture, but he could not understand. And now the Holy Spirit spoke again. And told Philip, go to him, that man, go to him. But all this time, all this time he left where he was, the Holy Spirit told him to move, go this way, go the way that leads to the desert, uh, go through the desert, go through that way. He did not give another thing to do. He didn't tell me, talk to him on any other thing to do. The next time the Holy Spirit was talking to him was when that man was on the way. When he saw the man, he said, this man, and only God knows how, how many hours he traveled that road. Only God knows the hunger that hit him on the road. Only God knows. The Bible didn't tell us, or the troubles he went through that road. It was a way that a way of the desert. And yet, at the end of that silence, the Holy Spirit now broke the silence and said, Behold, go and meet that man on the on the horse. Philip obeyed the last instruction. The last instruction before he hit the desert, before he hit the road was go on the road that leads to the desert. And he went to keep going. If you think you that God is silent, that He used to talk to you, then consider the last instruction He gave to you. If you're on the right path, sometimes God can keep quiet for a long time. Even your GPS, if you are traveling a long journey, the GPS may tell you you'll be on this road for hundred miles. And I tell you something: the who is the the, the GPS will be silent for for perhaps two hours, not telling you anything. I remember when my mother visited us to here in United States, and uh, she was hearing the GPS saying, "Take left, take right, um, uh, keep keep on this road for five miles." You know, she was hearing other things. Then at the point, she wasn't hearing another thing. One hour, two hours, three hours, no, everywhere silent. And then she asked me, "Nah." <laughs> your GPS is the battery down is it what is wrong I said why, why, why are you asking why is it he said I don't, we don't talk again I said oh it will talk at the right time that is even for the GPS for the GPS we obey the last command the last instruction if we will obey the instruction of the Holy Spirit even when he appears to keep quiet we obey the last command we shall not miss road. The Holy Spirit. Is he talking to somebody tonight? <laughs> oh my goodness. The Holy Spirit might even take you on a pathway of difficulty. Is it not true? Even for Jesus. The Bible says after the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit now led Jesus into the desert. You think that it was Jesus that on his own went to that desert. It was the Holy Spirit that led him there. That's what the Bible says. There he was to be tempted. And he fasted there for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil came to that desert and began to, to tempt Jesus. The Holy Spirit knew that the devil would come. He still led him to that place. He led him to that desert. To that wilderness. Is it possible that the Holy Spirit can lead us to the wilderness? Sure. He can. Look at even the blind man. He was led to the road that leads to Jericho. A narrow, lonely road 
thieves used to be on that road. But this, that was where the Holy Spirit led him. The difficult way. The Holy Family, they were also led to the desert on their way to Egypt. The Holy Spirit can take you to unfamiliar territory. But when, he, when he's doing it, he's doing it to glorify God. He's doing it for a reason. But when that is the decision of heaven for us, let us persevere like the blind man. Let us persevere. So it is important to make the right prayer point. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, help me to see. Father, direct me on the steps to take on this mission. These are the right prayer points. And if you're asking God, is, it my life, is this person my life partner? If God is not talking to you, don't go and say yes to the person. Until God talks to you. If he talks to you and says no, forget it. Some people say yes, even when God has said no. And yet, they, not that they don't know that God has said no. They know that God said, don't marry this man. Yes, they go ahead to marry this man because maybe, I mean, this man is handsome. I mean, this man is rich. I mean, this man is well educated. Oh, this man is in overseas. I want to have overseas experience. I've run into such people in ministry that have gone into mar marriages, not because this was what God told them to do. In fact, God even told them not to, not to get into the marriage, and they got in because they wanted their own desire, not the desire of God. And that li usually leads to problems. Problems that we begin to regret even along the way. My dear friends in Christ, as we are coming to the end of this message, I wish to draw our attention tonight to what the Bible tells us in Luke 18, verse 35 to 43. I'm saying in verse 43 that immediately the man regained his sight, he followed Jesus, glorifying him. And the people, all the people joined him to glorify God. When we make the right prayer point, we get the result. And when we get the result, we glorify God. We begin to praise God. We praise God because God is good. <laughs> Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says, the Lord is good. <laughs> A stronghold in the day of trouble. He protects those who take refuge in him. Indeed, the blind man has seen that the Lord is good. For the Lord had become his stronghold in the day of trouble. Let us trust in him. Let us trust in him. We ask him to reveal to us what to do concerning the situation we are going through. We are asking the Holy Spirit to reveal things to us, to speak to us, even in dreams and in visions, to speak to us in the form and the language that we shall understand, to tell us the right way to take, the right prayer to make concerning the situation we are going through. Can you talk to God now? Can you talk to God now? It's not that you have not, you have not been praying, you have been praying. But who knows, maybe the reason why you haven't gotten a result may be that there's a wrong prayer point. Maybe you are asking God to give you a stool to sit down. <laughs> or maybe you are asking God to give you a golden plate for, to, to, to beg for money, to, to beg for the coins from people. And the blind man did not make those prayer points. All he said is that, Lord, may I see. He was suffering from big problem. And God. God visited him. God visited him. May God visit us tonight. May God do something new tonight. Let us talk to him. Let us talk to him. Whatever the disability we are going through, even the, this blind man, blindness was his, his own disability. Blindness. And God took away that disability. What is the disability in your life? 
What is the disability in your marriage, in your business? What is the disability in your career? Can you talk to God now? Can you talk to God now? God, that I may see, that I may walk, that I may hear. That this disability may be turned around to the glory of your name. If you remember, even Luke, uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 17, we see the story of another disability, a woman bent over by the devil for 18 years. And Jesus came to the synagogue in Luke 13, verse 10, and he healed her. In Luke 13, verse 13, he laid his hands on her and healed her instantly. And the Bible also says or tells us in Luke 13, verse 13, b that when she was healed, when she was threatened, she began to praise God. You see, there's a pattern that when God settles to somebody, the next thing is praise, the next thing is to follow Jesus, the next thing is to worship him, the next thing is to make him your friend. If God blesses us and we do not come to pray, we do not pray the way we used to pray, we begin to go away from God. That is wrong. That is anti-scriptural. So we talk to God at this hour. Father, Lord, reveal to me what to do concerning this situation. Help me to stand strong. Help me to get a testimony. Holy Spirit, reveal to me the right prayer, the right thing to do. Tell me, am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right path? Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me. And if I'm in, on the right path, and all I need is to persevere, give me the grace to persevere. Give me that integrity to persevere, the virtue of perseverance. Help me. Even Elijah, when he was praying for rain to fall, to make the land wait after so many years of drought. And he prayed once, he did not get the results. Twice, three, third time, fourth time, he prayed and prayed, there was no result. Until the seventh time, perseverance. And heaven was made open and there was a downpour in the land. If God is telling you to wait, if God is telling you to keep praying, then keep praying. Father, we ask you to take over. Thank you, Lord, because of what you are doing even now. Even your people are talking to you. Your people are praying now. Father, we know you are doing something now. Father, we pray that the troubles we are going through shall at the end bring glory to your name. Father, even in the case of the blind man in Luke 18, verse 38, and it was said, verse 43 rather, and it was said that the blind man, when he was healed, then he began to worship God. He began to follow Jesus. I began to glorify him. Lord, help us to glorify you. That, who, that which will make you to be glorified, may that come our way. May that come our way. That which will make you to be praised, Father, may that testimony come. In the name of Jesus, help us to have a constant companionship with you. Because even this blind man, when you healed him, then that brought him closer to you. Then the Bible says in Luke 18, verse 43b, and he began to follow Jesus. He followed Jesus, glorifying God. Father, Lord, this testimony that is on the way coming, may it be a testimony that will increase our faith in you. May it be a testimony that will... Glorify your name. A testimony that will keep us, you know, into a constant companionship with you. Forever with you. And never leaving you. But being with you all the time. For being with you is what you want. To seek you is what you want. And your word says, Thou shalt seek me with all your heart, and you shall find me. Therefore, mighty God, may we find you in the situations we go through. Even our trials and our struggles, may we find you, O Lord. Father, may we find you in the name of Jesus. May we experience your power in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of trials, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Ancient of Days. Thank you for this miracle you have done. Thank you for the grace you have given. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. And Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you amongst men, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Oh.
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now until the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We we'll cover the message with the most precious blood of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>